do the technical and we start started the recording. Cool. So welcome everybody to our webinar on Winters Hall Deer, um, Germany's biggest oil and gas company. My name is Sonja Meister. I'm an energy campaigner from Urgewald and I will facilitate this meeting today. Um, we will explain to you today why we called Wintersaldea one of Germany's biggest climate villains. And we are happy um, that you joined us today since um, there's still many people who barely know the company. And um, there's a lot to know about this company. And we want to use this opportunity today to shine a light on um, a couple of the activities. And I'm really, really happy to have here speakers today, Louise Wilson, who will tell us more, especially about their Russian business and um, the links of the Russian business with war crimes in Ukraine. Then we have Andreas Randoy from Greenpeace Norway, who will us tell, uh, tell us more about their production in Norway and especially in the Arctic. And Esteban Servat uh, from Argentina, who is really involved in the frontline struggles there and uh, will tell us more about their fracking business in Argentina. So I hope we will have an exciting round. Um, it's only a start of it because as I said, there will be even more. So we hope to make it a webinar series and even continue next year. And uh, I will now uh, as a start, give you a quick overview about what the company is, what they are doing, and yeah, why we assume they are big climate villain. I will share my screen with you. So I hope you can see it, right? Good. Um, so who is Winter's idea? A quick overview. Um, if we look at the company, first of all, it's good to say who the owners are. The company is owned by majority by the German chemical giant BASF. They own about 72.7% of the shares of the company. The other owner is Letter One. That is a company of Russian oligarchs who are mostly on the sanction list. And they own about 27.3% of the company. Wintersaldea as such is Europe's biggest independent exploration and production company of oil and gas. Independent because they are not listed on the stock market yet. They are also Germany's biggest gas and oil company. Uh, I will start very shortly with looking at their Russian business, but I won't take it too long here since Louis will tell you more about it. Uh, what's really important is if you look at the first nine months of this year that you can see they made profits of about 1.3 billion euros in Russia with the production of oil and gas. That's five times more than last year. And this is five times more in a year where we had the war in Ukraine. They are really uh, a lot exposed to Russia because nearly half of the oil and gas is produced in Russia. And they paid a couple of hundred of millions of euros of taxes in Russia. Um, very important is also um, a link in between um, their gas condensate production in Russia and jet fuel that is produced for fighter jets. But that's the story Luis will tell you more about just to point it out at the beginning. Um, then very important also to know, um, BSF and also Letter One already have planned an IPO of the company two times. IPO means that they want to have an initial public offering. So they want to sell the company on the stock market um, so that other people would take over the capital and ownership. Um, they had to stop it the last time shortly before the invasion in Ukraine because of their high exposition to Russia. Now it's interesting because they're currently under hard pressure to kind of give up or split off the Russian business. 
because an IPO is impossible as long as they will continue the Russian business, as long as we have a war in Ukraine. But in the recent interviews, they said they still want to have an IPO. It might not happen within the next six months, not in the current structure. But there's a certain risk that as soon as they would split up the Russian business, they might do an IPO. And that's also um, yeah, a big issue and might the biggest fossil IPO in Europe that is still a threat to come. Their business is clearly not in line with 1.5 degrees. You might have heard of the IE net zero um, scenario, but says that you shouldn't develop any new oil and gas resources if you want to stay in line with 1.5 degrees. Uh, the only exception are projects which are already committed by the end of 2021. And we had some research which looked at which of their projects are not in line with this IE net zero scenario. And that's an overshoot of more than 73%. So nearly impossible for them to stay in line with 5.5 degrees. And they are clear expansionists. They're also the fourth biggest producer worldwide in the Arctic. And in 2021, they produced 56.5% of the gas and oil in the Arctic. Um, that's partly here in Norway, um, where you see a picture of a site near their um, production sites in the sea. And also a lot comes from Russia, where you can see here Achim Gas, that's the joint venture they're having with Gazprom, also in the Arctic. Um, also, nearly 100% of their revenues come from oil and gas. They don't own a single windmill, they don't have any solar projects. They don't even have set any targets to reduce their dependence from fossil fuels in future. So they're completely set on gas and oil. And I will tell you them you a bit more about what they think might be solutions later. Um, they're also doing fracking in Argentina and Russia. Fracking is extremely harmful. As you know, chemicals are pressed with high pressure under the earth, pollutes groundwater, causes earthquakes, pollutes the air, depletes water. I will also not tell you much more about it because Esteban will talk especially about their activities here in Argentina in Vaco Muerte. But um, they're not only doing fracking in Argentina, they're also doing it in Russia. And I just showed you that picture of Aringas. That's another site where they, for example, use fracking. Um, <clears throat> they're also involved in a number of high-risk offshore projects, partly in Norway and the Barents Sea, where I think um, Andreas will tell us more about it. And I also put you here a picture of Vega Playade, that's the world's southernmost production platform that's offshore near Patagonia. Um, also, to have a regional example from Germany, um, they are producing crude oil in the Wardensee National Park. And I just applied for new oil drillings and they asked to um, produce here until 2069 a number which is not aligned with any of European or global numbers of when we should have phased out oil and gas. And it is in a very ecologically sensitive area. <clears throat> the Wattensee National Park is an area with a huge importance for bird migration on a World Heritage Site. <clears throat> then, The company is also facing a climate lawsuit in Germany. Deutsche Umwelthilfe has sued them. And um, they demand that they bring their business and especially their gas and oil production in line with their remaining Paris budget. But that would mean that they wouldn't be able to develop any new gas and oil fields from 2026 at the latest. With other words, that would mean an end to their business model. What are the solutions that uh, Winter Saldia says? Because for sure, they also claim that they are progressive and green and so on. First of all, um, they have massive methane emissions because as you know, gas consists mainly of methane and it uh, emits during production, transport, and uh, when it's uh, finally used. They have really high targets where they say how they would reduce methane emissions, but they don't show any concrete measures how to do it. So it's just on paper, I would say. 
Um, as solutions, I mostly propose carbon capture and storage, CCS. So they have projects to store it under sea, um, projects to transport COT from other countries to Norway to store it there. Just to keep it short, CCS has been um, named as a solution by the oil and gas industry for decades, but it had been technically economically unfeasible for decades too. And so far we can't see that this is going to work out. Um, they also talk a lot about hydrogen, but uh, what they mean is blue hydrogen. So it's hydrogen, which would be derived from fossil gas. And many studies show that this even causes more emissions than the direct use of gas. So this was a very short overview. Um, we will also share a briefing with you. And I will now hand over directly to Luis. Luis is a senior campaigner from Global Witness. And he works a lot on the companies who still kind of um, finance or fuel the war in Russia. Um, you have exposed many scandals and you will tell us more about what Wintersal there is doing in Russia and what the latest big scandal in the media had been. So Luis, be welcome. I will now stop my screen sharing and hand it over to you. Great, thanks so much. Sonia, and uh, thank you to everybody involved in, in putting, uh, in organizing this conversation. Um, there are many aspects of Vintersal's business model that we'll go into today, which are uh, outrageous or, or scandalous. Um, and, and certainly their Russian exposure is, um, is high on that list. Um, and so today I'm going to focus on the more unusual aspects of Vintersal's relationship with Russia. It's perhaps one of the most unusual um, relationships um, that a European company has with Russia at the moment. Um, and Vintersal finds itself uniquely exposed amongst all uh, Western fossil fuel companies to Russia. Um, and that's really because of a fundamentally bad bet that Vintersal made many years ago. And of course, we know that um, fossil fuel companies like Vintersal like taking risks. Um, they have a lot of money to to play with, um, and sometimes these executives take big bets. And Vintersal took perhaps the worst bet uh, of all. And I think, uh, as we'll as we'll see over the next um, the course of this conversation, they will eventually be made to pay for this mistake. Um, but that moment of reckoning has has not yet come, um, and it really started for Vintersal in Russia um, 30 years ago. So the, the company has been active in Russia for, for a long time um, and uh, has been seriously involved in the extraction of gas uh, and gas condensate um, for, for, for nearly that entire period. Um, but it's really been in the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years, um, in which Vintersal has made itself almost utterly and completely dependent on Russian reserves for its um, for its profitability, and it's and it's funny, Sonia, you 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 opened um, very well by describing in part Vinsal as a German company, um, and there is an argument to be made that Vinsal is not a German company, that Vinsal is a company uh, that is based in Germany, uh, perhaps for for political or fiscal reasons, but really is a is a is a company that is fundamentally Russian, and there are a couple of reasons for that, but the first and most obvious is that the bulk of Vinsal's gas, the stuff of which the company is made, is in Russia. Um, so of its proven reserves, Vintersal has 80% of those in, in the ground in Siberia and the Arctic, um, which is an enormous number. Um, and and we can, we'll talk a little bit of, uh, today about, about where those figures have gone and, and its current production, how much it's actually getting out of the ground. Um, but even now, um, so deep into this war with, with Ukraine, Vintersal is still getting around half uh, of its active production out of the ground in, in Russia. And so when you look around the, uh, the, the, the other majors, um, not companies that we know for their, for their morals, uh, not companies that we know for being particularly progressive or, or taking decisions uh, for the right reason, even amongst those, we're talking about Exxon, we're talking about Shell, we're talking about BP, we're talking about Total Energies. Even among those, Vintersal um, stands out for its extraordinarily uh, poor reaction to the war in Ukraine. 
Um, and I think, again, this comes back to this awful uh, bet, this historic bet that Vimsar made on production in Russia, on reserves in Russia, um, which has meant that where for Total Energy, where for Shell, BP, Exxon, um, leaving Russia was a, 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 a big financial hit, to be sure. Um, many of them so much so that they've not yet completed the process. And I, and I believe that, that, that some of them never will. Uh, but for Vintersal, this is an existential question. There is no path to profitability for Vintersal without these reserves in Siberia. And so uh, it is through this to see the company's subsequent uh, statement. Luis, your, um, sorry, the volume, there's something wrong with the sound. Okay, can, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, you're not that loud now. Okay, uh, apologies, let me... No, is that, is that working now? Is that better? Can you hear me? It's a bit better if you put it close to your mouse now, but something changed. I don't know what. Okay, strange. Sorry. Let me. Um. Yeah. I'll I'll speak up and hold it here. Um. So so yeah. So this so this historic bet that that Vintersal took, um, over the course of the past thirty years has left it completely dependent on Russia. Um. And it is as I say through this context that we can see Vintersal's uh, actions and statements um, after the the invasion, the full-scale invasion in, in February. Um, so it, it, the extent to which Vintersal is, is dependent on Russia is, is obvious in its reserves, which I've already mentioned, 80%. Um, it has three uh, joint ventures with, with Gazprom, um, which are all based in the very far north of Russia. Um, and there it does uh, very deep drilling into the Arctic permafrost, uh, some, some deeper than 4,000 meters, which is um, unusually deep for, for such projects. Um, and it gets, uh, it gets primarily gas and gas condensate, um, which of course have been uh, in the past 30 years, crucial building blocks for, for Germany's economy, um, for, uh, for, for, for Western Europe. Uh, that has changed, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about how that has changed and why that's important um, in a second. Um, but Vintersal was also implicated uh, in Nord Stream 2. So Vintersal, um, again, in a demonstration of how big it had bet, invested uh, close to a billion um, in, uh, in Nord Stream 2. Um, and of course, all of that has now uh, come to nothing. So when Vintersal's world turned upside down, because I think it's fair to say that this is, a, 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 this is what happened on February 24th for, for Vintersal, not to, to minimize, of course, uh, the, the, the far worse situation for um, the people of Ukraine. Um, but I think it's fair to say that when your business model is bet on one country and that country uh, begins openly committing war crimes, that turns your, or at least should turn your business model upside down. Um, on the evening of, of that invasion, Vintersal uh, was not trying to extricate itself from its Russian business model because it knew, I would argue, that it was too late. And so instead, it was pushing in the other direction. Um, and there are really three key things that, that Vintersal did um, just before as Russia was invading Ukraine that I think are demonstrative of the company's mindset, attitude, and which point to this idea that actually Vintersal is more of a Russian company almost than it is a German company. The first is that on the eve of Russia's invasion, as it became clear through Western intelligence reports um, that Russia was going to invade Ukraine, um, already Dea, one of the, the parent uh, institutions of, of Vintersal, um, was advocating against punitive measures uh, against Russia, saying that you know whatever happens, there must not be uh, sanctions on Russian energy, of course, knowing that that would be a death knell for, for Vintersal. So that was number one. Um, when Germany then suspended Nord Stream 2, uh, instead of you know, doing some soul searching about the bad business decisions that Vinstal had made, instead, um, it was arguing that it should be compensated by the German taxpayer um, for its historic mistake. Um, so again, you know, similar to 2008, asking to be bailed out essentially for, 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 for terrible uh, decision that was, that was made. Um, and finally, and the most damning, the one that perhaps the company itself, Vintersal, would laugh off um, or brush away 
uh, but to me speaks volumes is that, and it's still on the website, everybody can, can check it out today. Um, Vintersal, when uh, they issued late, even for, for, for an oil company, their condemnation of Russia's aggression, they used the Kremlin's term for the invasion. And again, I think it, you know, this speaks volumes to whether we should see Vintersal as a German company with operations in Russia uh, or as something different, as, as, as a company that is, that is actually uh, Russian. Um, and, and they use the term military operation when describing uh, what it was that, that Russia was doing, um, which is not something that you'll read in any of the other press releases from BP, Shell, uh, Exxon, Total Energy. And that's because the audience for Vintersal's communications is a little bit different. The audience for Vintersal's communications is further east, is in Moscow. Um, and so that is also something that we have to bear in mind. Uh, so where do we stand now, Vintersal in Russia? Well, um, you know, of course, like every other oil and gas company, revenues and profits are sky high. Um, so as, as Sonia mentioned, 1.3 billion in profits um, from, from Russia this year. Um, and, and as I mentioned, 50% of Vintersal's production this year globally, you know, a company that produces all around the world, 50% of the hydrocarbons that Vintersal managed to get out of the ground this year came out of the Russian uh, Arctic. Um, where else do we stand? So uh, clearly, you know, one of the, the justifications that Vintersal gave for, for remaining in Russia, for continuing to produce these hydrocarbons, this gas in, in, in Siberia, was that it was necessary for Europe's energy security. This is a phrase that, uh, that, uh, that we're starting to hear a lot from, from these companies. Sadly, for Vintersal, that excuse is no longer plausible. Because, as we all know, uh, Russia very predictably through the course of this year uh, has slowly turned off the taps uh, to the extent to which that, um, and this was just uh, released a couple of days ago, November's totals um, were the lowest yet from Russia, gas flows from Russia. Um, and so we are at less than 20% of last year's um, flows from Russia into Europe this November. And so really the excuse that Vintersal gave that this was about Europe's energy security um, doesn't pass water anymore. So it'd be interesting to see how the company evolves that. Um, but another reason, as Sonia pointed out, that the company in Russia uh, can no longer use this excuse of Europe's energy security um, is the fact that its production has now been linked um, with the, the Russian military. And it reflects another sad fact that it is not possible. Um, and I think anybody here would have seen this. Uh, it, it, it's quite surprising that the CEO of Intercell has taken so long to see it himself. Um, it is not possible to produce such large quantities of fossil fuels in Russia without being complicit in Russia's war uh, on Ukraine. And that's something that Ukrainian officials have made very clear. Um, that's something that they've been warned about throughout the past 10 months. And yet, when they were confronted with the findings uh, from a, a, a joint investigation between Global Witness, De Spiegel and ZDF, um, which linked the gas taken out of the ground by Vintersal um, with Russian war crimes committed against Ukrainian civilians, including a March 3 attack on, on Chernihiv, which killed 47 people who were queuing for food, um, that Vintersal uh, seemed surprised by our findings. They hadn't bothered to check actually, whether their gas that they were selling to Gazprom um, was being used by the Russian military or was ending up in the Russian military in any way. Now, we believe that the link is clear um, and that it is up to Vintersal to prove and to make sure that their gas, if they are going to continue extracting it in Siberia, uh, is not ending up in, in Russian warplanes, is not literally fueling the attacks against Ukrainian uh, civilians, which we continue to see uh, on, a, on an almost uh, daily basis. Um, the company is not able to, to guarantee that. Um, for us, the supply chain link is very clear. Um, we've, we have um, very detailed, very granular uh, data on um, commodity movements inside of Russia. And we've seen a big increase of gas condensate, um, which is a liquid similar to oil, uh, which is produced by, um, by Vintersal. Uh, that, that gas condensate is now moving increasingly in large amounts um, from the north of Russia, Siberia, where it's pulled out of the ground, and the west of Russia, and 
the border of Ukraine. And from there, we've been able to trace shipments to air bases um, where Russia is flying its attacks into Ukraine from. Um, and we've also seen enormous increase in uh, the amount of diesel that is being shipped. So Vintasal is, is clearly um, complicit with uh, the actions committed by um, these, uh, these, these, these fighter jets. Uh, it is clearly complicit um, with the Kremlin's war because of the many billions of euros that it has paid um, into uh, Russia's coffers over the years. Um, and so I think the question for, for us, I guess, today is what, what should we do about it? Um, uh, you know, some people here have some experience of advocating, uh, of engaging rather with Vintasal. I think it's clear um, to many people here that, that, that because this is an existential matter, um, Vintasal is not going to give up its uh, profits unless it is made to do so. That, 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 that is my belief, that is the belief of Global Witness. And so we are not bothering to engage directly with Vintasal, rather we are going uh, to the German government. And we've actually seen since the publication of this report, which was published um, last month, the German government actually standing up and getting interested in this. So uh, officials um, immediately held talks with Vintasal after the report was published, uh, proving this uh, link between Vintasal's production and, and the Russian military. Um, and what we've also now seen is a push from both Ukrainian civil society, German civil society, um, to regardless of whether Vintasal will, will, will pull out of Russia, which it seems clear it will not, the German state can and has the power to redirect those profits, to tax any Russian profits made by Vintasal at 100% and redirect them uh, to the reconstruction of Ukraine. And that is a clear moral case, but it also makes sense for the German taxpayer. The German taxpayer will have to fund the reconstruction of Ukraine in some part. That much is clear. Um, and the more that Vintersal is fueling and uh, funding the war through its payments to the Kremlin's coffers, um, you, you are prolonging the war and you are also deepening the eventual cost for the German taxpayer. So the quickest way to end this war, of course, is to stop producing and trading Russian fossil fuels is to stop buying Russian fossil fuels and therefore to stop funding the war. Um, and the money that has already been made, which Ukrainian campaigners have called blood money, um, and rightly so, must be redirected to the reconstruction of Ukraine, um, both as a moral point, but also uh, as a point of, of expediency. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm personally really excited to hear um, the other amazing campaigners that we have uh, speaking today because uh, you know, my familiarity with those parts of the world is not, uh, Vintasal's model in those parts of the world is not so strong, but I'm certain that there will be similarities um, in some of the hypocrisy that Vintasal has displayed and, and, in, and the aggression and the, the disregard for human life that Vintasal has displayed. Um, so, so looking forward to hearing those and of course, looking forward to taking any questions um, that anybody has about Vintasal in Russia um, after the presentation. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot uh, for sharing um, for sharing this, and I'm sure people will have questions. Um, um, we will have a collected session for that afterwards. Um, or Oleg, is it straightforward? Yeah, Here. the question. Yeah, um, the question is: um, uh, there were reports that uh, German government was in some kind of talks with Wintershall, uh, which was reported on seventh of November. Uh, are there any known details on that? What <laughs> is the format of these talks, and what what is being discussed there? Sonia, so I, I'll just take that quickly because it is relatively straightforward. Uh, we, the, the truth is that we don't know exactly what the German government has said to Vintersal, but from our conversations with uh, officials in the Foreign Office and the Chancellery, we do know that they are uh, conducting what's called an internal uh, inquiry into this. Um, so there is a fact-finding mission of sorts going on uh, to establish the facts of this case, whether Vintersal's production is uh, indeed um, fueling the, the Russian military. And we were told, you know, as close as they would get, and, and this was not, you know, sorry, uh, public comment, uh, there could be, um, if, if that investigation finds uh, wrongdoing, there could be a public inquiry. So uh, it could become a, a public investigation. Um, but, but as of yet, the shape of that is uncertain. Uh, so we need as much pressure as possible on the government in order to make sure that they take this seriously. 
and any pressure from the Ukrainian side and especially the government for sure is welcome. Good, that was a direct question. Um, I think it would be okay, but we can also have a collective round of questions later. So if you're fine, I would first say we continue with our next speaker. Um, that's Andreas Randoy from Norway. Um, he's working as a climate and energy advisor for Greenpeace Norway. And he campaigns especially for a, a just energy transition away from fossil fuels, and especially also getting away from fossil fuel production in the Arctic. So Andreas, I think we are um, happy or very excited to hear what you can tell us from the Norwegian um, side and uh, winter saw ideas activities in Norway. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you also to, to Louis for that uh, presentation. I mean, it, I, I think it's really telling that, that this, I mean, this is a huge story, but it hasn't at all broken in Norway, even though Wintershall is a large actor. Um, Norway initially threw out, I think it was two companies directly tied to Russia, but uh, Wintershall has managed to sort of seem like a non-Russian company. So I hope we can look more into this uh, and, and reveal those ties. So what I'll be speaking about today is uh, Wintershall Dea's uh, activities in Norway and especially in the northern areas of Norway. So I work as energy, climate and oil campaigner here for Greenpeace Norway. Uh, and uh, oil is something that we've worked on for a long time. And I think we're going to do that uh, for some time uh, going forward. And the Arctic is really where the battle has, has gone. So this is an image of uh, the Trana Reef. It is a coral reef outside of Norway. Uh, in fact, it's the world's largest uh, cold water coral reef. Here in Trana, we find about 1,500 independent coral reefs. Some of them are over 7,000 years old. And this area is one of the areas that Wintershaldea is threatening by drilling for oil and uh, emitting harmful chemicals and also physically polluting the area. Another area that Wintershaldea is threatening in Norway is uh, Bear Island, which is this picture. So Bear Island got its name in, I think, the 1500s when some explorers came and found polar bears on the island. And uh, this is an area uh, roughly 300 kilometers north from the northernmost point of mainland Norway. And this is also a biodiversity hotspot, especially for seabirds who stop here and hatch every summer. Uh, so. I want to give you some background on the Norwegian oil and gas industry. Norway is Europe's largest fossil fuel producer by far, especially now that Russia is being phased out. And this has a lot to say for Norwegian emissions as well. So every year, Norway emits about 50 million tons of CO2. But uh, the oil and gas that we produce every year becomes roughly 500 million tons of CO2. That makes Norway the seventh largest exporter of uh, CO2 per capita. We are, I think last year, actually the number one country in per capita scope three emissions. So that's exported emissions from oil and gas and, and coal. Uh, and Wintershall is certainly a part of this trend of Norwegian or oil companies operating within Norway and, uh, and uh, limiting climate action. So right now, Wintershall holds 87 licenses. Uh, they are the operator on 24 of them. That means that they are the uh, largest stockholder and the ones uh, practically um, developing the field. And uh, four of these fields uh, have actually made discoveries. Um, and they are active both in the North Sea, the Norwegian Sea, and the Barents Sea. So what these numbers show is that Wintershall is exploring a lot 
outside of Norway, but they haven't actually been that successful, I would say, luckily. Uh, for instance, when they explored in Tranarebe, they did not find enough oil for that to be profitable to extract. And the same also with the northernmost oil licenses. But some of them have been successful uh, and they have made some discoveries. And there is no real indication that they're going to halt this exploration going forward. And I want to always remind people that when we talk about exploration licenses, we are not talking about um, shutting off oil tomorrow. In, on average, it takes between 10 to 15 years between you make a discovery and you can start producing oil. And an oil field would typically last for 20, 30, 40 years. So if Wintershell makes a discovery on one of these fields today, they might start production in 2035 and go on far beyond 2050 when we are supposed to be in a net zero emissions economy. So clearly, this activity is in violation of the climate goals. And we also heard this recently from the IEA, uh, which said that all new oil licenses handed out after 2021 are in violation of the one and a half degree goals. So in particular, Wintershall has also gotten a reputation in Norway for being involved in especially controversial projects, both in the Arctic and otherwise. And Overall, uh, Wintershall contributes to 80 million tons of CO2. Uh, that would, that's number from 2020, but uh, this year's number is uh, quite similar. And most of that is from scope three. So again, that is actually more than all of Norway combined. Uh, I already mentioned the Tranarif, and I think this is important to note because it was most Norwegians' first impression of Wintershall Dea. Before this, they had been quite anonymous, not really um, an operator on any especially large or controversial field. But this is an area known to most Norwegians because it, it is a, I mean, just look at the pictures. These are beautiful areas. And we have a large and, and quite sustainable fishing industry in Lofoten uh, in this area. And many of the areas around here are protected from oil drilling, but not this exact area. Uh, and what made it even more controversial was that when we went into the impact assessment that uh, Winter Chaldea had made, we found several flaws. We found that they would use harmful chemicals and that their spill analysis showed that if there was an oil spill, uh, this would impact the coral reef extremely. Uh, this is a map showing Wintershaldea's uh, licenses. So on the left, left side, you see their current licenses in Norway. Uh, so mostly they're in the Norwegian Sea and the North Sea, but also somewhat in the Barents Sea. The pink one in the Barents Sea and the North there, that's Snövit or Snow White in English. They have uh, strange names. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, this is the only one that Wintershall has in production today in the Barents Sea. But as you see, they are exploring and then trying to find new fields in this area, which we know is very vulnerable to oil drilling. And uh, this table shows you the current production of Wintershall Dea from uh, Norwegian oil and gas platforms. So I thought that might be useful for you. And if you want me to send any of this information on email, I'd be happy to do that, that afterwards. Uh, so Wintershall is also involved in Arctic oil drilling. And why is that especially uh, important? Well, there are several reasons. I mean, first of all, the world has found far more fossil fuels than we can ever use. Uh, the world doesn't need more oil and gas if we are to meet our own climate commitments. We know that both from the IPCC and the IEA and, and the UN General Secretary, we don't need more harmful and polluting oil and gas. We also know that the Arctic environment is especially vulnerable and valuable. There have been several studies showing that the exact type of pollutants we see from oil drilling and God forbid the spill uh, would be especially harmful to those species. 
And I think many people believe that, you know, the Arctic is some kind of ocean desert, and it, it really couldn't be further from the truth. For instance, uh, the ice edge zone or the marginal ice zone, where the ice meets ocean every year, you know, that ice moves back and forward. This area contains thousands of species. And that is just one of the areas where oil companies such as Vintos Aldea is currently lobbying to get into. Lastly, in this presentation, I want to mention uh, Vintos Aldea's reluctance to comply with environmental law. Now, this was something we uncovered in the campaign against their drilling in the Trana Reef. And our line of argument was that a company with this long, running streak of committing environmental crimes should not be the company responsible for one of the most dangerous oil drillings in a region petroleum history. Uh, so Vintoshal has received criticism not only for the from the environmental NGOs, but also from official uh, the, uh, the Ministry of the Environment of Norway. Uh, one of the most uh, Shocking examples of this is the Brage oil field in the North Sea. They have seen several deviations from regulations. Well, actually, I should say deviation from regulation. That is the sort of Vintoshal uh, lobbyist way to, to say it. It's, I mean, it's a crime. It's not following the law. It's emitting harmful pollutants when you don't have the, the proper documentation to do that. And uh, in fact, in, in 2020, several environmental NGOs reported Vinto Chaldea to the police for deliberately emitting large amounts of toxic chemicals from hydraulic pumps over several years. So to wrap this up, Vinto Chaldea is one of the companies responsible for trying to push Norway and our oil and gas industry further into the Arctic, despite our climate commitments. So very glad to see that we are a lot of people resisting Winter Chaldea and uh, all of the petroleum sector. And uh, let's keep that up. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Andreas. Um, I think this was a great overview about what they're doing in Norway and also how much um, they are a kind of reliable environmental partner. Um, if you mentioned these uh, scandals. Um, I would say in case there's no direct question now, because we can have a question session later, I would directly uh, give it to our last speaker, Esteban Servat. So um, we're also really looking forward to your input. If you are a scientist, frontline environmental activist, and uh, founder of the organization EcoLeaks. And I know um, you have uh, really helped to build massive local resistance um, against uh, the um, production in Vaca Muerta in Argentina. And we are looking forward that you're telling us more about what's happening there, what's uh, so bad about the fracking uh, use there, what's happening with the local resistance and struggles. So Esteban, um, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Sonia. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you, Sonia, Diego, Andy, for organizing, for inviting me. It's great to be here. Great to see uh, a webinar taking place around the biggest fossil fuel company of Germany. Um, as Sonia was explaining, I come from Argentina. I come from Vaca Muerta. Vaca Muerta is a major carbon bomb, climate bomb for the planet, which will emit a nearly or more than 50 billion um, uh, tons of CO2. And this is one of many carbon bombs around the world, and especially in global South countries that are being exploited in this neo-colonial dynamics of European multinational companies and other multinational companies, but the European ones are leading the way. Wintersal, Equinor from Norway, Total from France, BP from England, uh, Shell from the Netherlands, now British, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think the preceding speakers were extremely clear in showing the blatant disregard of Wintersal 
for life, uh, for the climate crisis, for the war crimes, and that its only mission is to maximize its profit and its willingness to take us down the tubes in that pursuit. I think Lewis was very clear when he said that the Intersal will not voluntarily take the right actions, but it will only do so when it is made, it is forced. And I think that's something that really resonates with me because um, even though I am a scientist, I come from science, what activism has shown me, has taught me the last few years, uh, both fighting in the Global South and in, in Europe since I came a little over three years ago because I had to flee Argentina because of intense persecution, death threats, criminal cases fabricated in a weaponized justice system that is used to silence and persecute activists. Uh, what I have learned is that uh, we will only win this if we can build power. Um, this is not a matter of the truth. This is not a matter of science only. We know we have the science. We know the truth is on our side. But these people are not following the science or the truth. They are actively, they know it, and they actively undermine it. They are funding fake science. They're funding misinformation, and they will do whatever it takes to continue to perpetrate their profits to extract the last drop of oil and gas from the earth, whether it be the Arctic, whether it be Vaca Muerta, whether it be Siberia, or anywhere they can. So they are literally waging war on humanity. And I think we as activists, also uh, NGO um, campaigners and anyone here, we need to really come to the understanding that there is a war going on, not because we want to, but there are people waging war on us and waging war on humanity. And no war has ever been won without a strategy, without strategic approach. And I think um, in the climate movement and elsewhere, I think we need to start thinking of strategies a lot more and how can we build power from the bottom up? And I think that's what I have, what I can contribute to this webinar the most of is from a grassroots perspective, what we have been doing for the last few years is to build power to start bringing movements together, workers and climate activists, indigenous and other social activists behind a common cause to target these multinational companies. Um, a bit over two years ago, we started the campaign in Germany, Wintersaal must fall. Uh, I will share with you a little video of one minute now, and uh, I will send some, some links to longer videos of some speeches there, including from um, a great Mapuche indigenous activist that we did the actions in Berlin. And, you know, when I arrived in Germany, I was surprised nobody knew Wintersaal. And I was going to give talks to groups of activists in Berlin, Hamburg, and elsewhere in Germany. And they were looking at me like, what are you talking about? You don't know Wintersaal, your biggest fossil fuel company. And they're doing this in Argentina and this and that. And then uh, people began to, you know, they were surprised. But it made me wonder, why is it? that uh, the largest economy of Europe, uh, a climate movement, in, needless to say the general public, but the climate movement of the biggest economy of Europe doesn't know the name of its own biggest fossil fuel company. So um, I think there's a lot behind that. I think there's a lot behind the invisibility of Wintersal, and I bet you they're putting a lot of resources in staying invisible. When we did the action in Berlin, it was hard to find them. The biggest city, the biggest company in the capital city of Germany only has a small office with an invisible, uh, you cannot even see, there's no name on the building. And there only has a tiny little name next to the bell that you almost have to go, uh, if, unless you know, you will never find it. So I think they're hiding in plain sight and it is uh, it's our challenge, our task. And I think it's a great uh, thing for this webinar to be doing this, to get them out of their invisibility, to, to, to remove the, ve the veil that is covering them. That's a big first step. And then the other next step that I think we should take is support grassroots uh, building of power, of uh, actually putting pressure on the streets, because I don't think it will be enough. All the important work, like for example, the one that is being done by the preceding speakers here, um, it's not enough unless we have power on the streets. All the petitions and all the legal actions that can be taken and denounced will not lead uh, far enough 
because this is not a problem of truth, it's a problem of power. So uh, we've been building these campaigns. I will show you a one minute video of this uh, global coalition that we built called Shale Must Fall, which is both Shale Must Fall and Winter Sal Must Fall are obviously inspired by the movement called Shell Must Fall, a Dutch movement that itself is inspired by an anti-colonial fight in South Africa. And together with them, we've been, we've been doing this campaigning and we mobilized thousands of people in more than 30 countries. Wintersal was one of the targets. People in Argentina brought petitions to the German embassy in Buenos Aires and to the German consulate in Vaca Muerta. They did so many times. All of these times, these things were unanswered. In these petitions, these letters were demanding a meeting with the ambassador, with the authorities, and uh, a hearing. They never responded uh, to take responsibility for their company. We also did it about Equinor, which is even, you know, is owned by the Norwegian state. And it, they also never replied. But I think that also shows how invisible people that are fighting in the global south are, and that the authorities from here don't even feel um, compelled to even respond. And I think people in Europe have a great uh, potential and a great also responsibility because we are here in the centers of power where activism does not involve risking your life or risking being tortured or all of the things that happen to people in the global south. Latin America has the largest murder rate in the world for environmental defenders. So being that these are European companies and that Europe, if any continent, can actually afford to lead the just transition, uh, it should be an example. And I think the population here, as in the climate movement, must do a lot more and help build power and bring the fight to their offices in Berlin and wherever they are to cast light on their crimes and, and help build power from the bottom up and from the grassroots and from the global south internationally to actually have a chance at winning in this uh, ever more unequal uh, fight. I will now show you a very brief video that I hope is going to give some inspiration and I hope we can come together and, and fight them. Let me see. coming together, connecting the global south and the global north. This is what it looks like to fight for 1.5. Wir Mapuche sagen, dass wir nicht damit einverstanden sind, dass multinationale Unternehmen unsere Ressourcen plundern, wie es seit mehr als 500 Jahren geschieht. Was die multinationale Unternehmen tun, ist die aktuelle Form des Kolonialismus. Andere nennen es Neokolonialismus. Diese Unternehmer werden die Reichtümer unseres Territorium ausbeuten, die Gewinne mitnehmen und die Umweltverschmutzung zurücklassen. Fight for climate justice. Winter shall fight must for fall. Climate. Shell must fall. BP must fall. Total must fall. They all must fall because we will have no future if they keep going. Let's stop fracking. Nicht in Vaca Muerta und auch nicht so bald. That's all. Thank you very much. I will share some links on the chat. Vice President. Okay. Thank you so much, Esteban. And I think that was a clear message that uh, more people should know about the company. More people need to get active and connected. And we hope that we did a little contribution here and uh, that this video brought you in the right mood of wanting to do more. Um, so um, we come now to the part where we will stop the recording of this webinar. Diego, do you stop the recording now? Can you maybe tell us?